Good morning. Glad to be with you all this morning. Most of you know me. Um, glad to have my wife with me this morning and fill in. So uh, Brent and the band can take a little time off. Please stand this morning as we uh, start singing praises to the Lord. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. My Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. My Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. And conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. My Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Hyde. I'm the pastor here at Park Street United Methodist Church. We are glad to have you in worship with us this morning. Uh, as we enter into this, uh, this day of worship, I want to invite you, if you would, to bow your heads with me as we go before God in prayer. O oh Lord of love, we come before you this morning full of praise. As we open our hearts to you and your word this day, let us be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we might become a beacon of joy and of hope for you and your kingdom. For we ask this all in Christ's holy name. Amen. Nothing worth more that'll ever come close. Nothing can compare your eye living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free. 
and the shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. You are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord.
has seen in honor, strength, and glory, and power be to you, the only wise King. Yeah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing. This time, our ushers are going to be passing around our offering boxes and baskets. Those are going to come from your right. If you'll pass those down to your left. Also, at this time, we are going to be dismissing for Kid Zone. So, uh, all the everyone who wants to head with with Miss Jessica and Miss Annette to Kid Zone, invite you to to head that way now, if you'd like. And as they're headed out, uh, we now enter the, the time of our, our worship service where we go before God in prayer. But before we bow our heads, before we uh, uh, offer ourselves before the Lord, I want to give all of you the chance to share any joys, concerns, any, any prayer requests that you might have. I have a couple that I want to lift up this morning. Uh, we want to continue to remember Fritzy Downing. I believe I, I saw this past week where she was able to, to go home. So good news there, but we want to keep Fritzy in our prayers as she continues to recover. Also want to continue to remember Mitzi Bondurant, who is uh, still at rehab, uh, rehabbing her, her foot and ankle. Uh, so we want to keep Mitzi in our prayers. And then a praise. I want to thank everybody who came out last night uh, for Pumpkin Fest and everybody who helped to make Pumpkin Fest happen Last night we had a, a great time here at the church, uh, had a lot of great community involvement, a lot of, lot of visitors from the community come to our campus and, uh, and share and, and join in that, that time with us. So thank you to everyone who came last night and a special thank you to all of you that, that helped to make last night happen. Uh, are there other, other prayers this morning, praises or concerns you wish to, to lift up?
fantastic. We're glad that, that your co-worker is able to, to be back at home now. I'm glad she's still recovering. Others today. Any others? Then I invite you now, if you would, to bow your heads with me as we go before God in prayer. O Lord of all creation, we bow before your glory. You are a God of love and hope, a God of goodness and mercy. Yet alas, we do not live up to your goodness. Our hope pales in comparison to you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for not placing ourselves, our, our hopes, solely in you. Forgive us for turning to power and wealth and other promises instead of turning towards your Son, Jesus Christ. Much like your servant Paul we often know what to do, and yet we still do not do it, Lord. We are weak. And yet we know that through the power and the strength of your Holy Spirit, we have the ability to turn away from our sin and towards the grace that is offered through you. On our own, we are helpless. But with your help, Lord, we, we are unstoppable. May we be inspired to live as the redeemed creation that you have called us to be. And so as we come together with thankful and faithful hearts this day, we, we pray, O oh Lord, for your church. As a people, as a community, you have called us to be in ministry with and for one another. You have asked us to be your hands and your feet, the very presence of Jesus Christ in the lives of those that we serve. And so this day we pray that you might help us to live up to this task and to do in every moment what your Son, Jesus, would do. Here today, our prayers of sorrow, our prayers of mourning, our prayers of intercessions and healing, our praises and our joys. For you are the God of all life. And no matter where we look, we will come to find you. Lord, we pray all these prayers today in the name of your Son, the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, beginning with verse 41. Hear now the word of the Lord. Excuse me, we're going to be at 37, not 41. I knew that was wrong. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. 
Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, and he put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him. Then he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we get started this morning, I want to invite you, uh, whether you're here in person or following along at home, uh, to take out your order of worship sheets or that worship email that was sent to you. Uh, there you'll find some, some fill-in-the-blanks. Uh, you'll also find a, a blank spot for you to take some notes. I want to encourage you to, to use those this morning. I feel sure that God will speak to us at some point in some way during this, this next little bit of time together. And so I want you to have that out and ready to write down whatever it is that you think God might be trying to speak to you this morning. So we are continuing today with our, our new sermon series titled David, where we are taking a look at the life and the stories that surround this, uh, this shepherd king, David, in our scriptures. Now, David's story, as we said last week, is a, a vastly complicated one. He's regarded by many as a, a biblical hero, one of the, the greatest. And yet we also know that David was not without his sins or his faults. He messes up time and time again. And yet he always maintains a faithful and persistent witness to God. That's what makes David's story so approachable. 
we can see elements of ourself, our own lives within his story. And we, hopefully, are inspired to remain as faithful as David himself. Now, if you were here last week when our series began, you may remember that we started by taking a look at the story of David's anointing at the hands of the prophet Samuel. David was the the youngest of all the brothers, and in being the youngest, he was the most unlikely to be anointed. And yet, we read these words. The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart doesn't mean that that David is sinless or or perfect, but it does mean that God sees him in a different way. God sees him in a different light, a different way than the rest of the world sees him. And the same is true for us. As baptized followers of Jesus Christ, we are told that when God looks upon us in our life, God does not not see us. God doesn't see David or or Joanne or, or Bob, but rather God sees Jesus Christ in us. God doesn't see us in our our own faults. God sees us in light of Jesus. And that's certainly good news, isn't it? That's good news that when God looks upon us, God doesn't see our sin or our trouble, but instead, God sees the person and the work of Jesus. And thank God for that. As we turn to this morning's story of David, we we find what is probably, well certainly, the most famous story about David from the Scriptures. And in fact, I I might argue, it might be the most well-known of any story in Scripture. The story of David and Goliath. I mean, I think you could pick almost anybody off the street. They could tell you this story about David and Goliath, or at least hit the highlights, right? Even those that aren't familiar with Scripture, those who have never stepped foot in the church, they could tell you about this story. We love this story, don't we? And we love all the stories that draw their themes from this story. Of David and Goliath. Think about all the movies you've ever watched. How many of them draw upon the themes of David and Goliath? Right? Sports movies love to draw on the theme of David and Goliath. The the underdog facing the giant. Impossible odds. An even more impossible outcome. We love those stories, right? Those those improbable come-from-behind victories. But there can be a problem with stories that we all know and love. And that's that the more we talk about those stories, the more we think we know about those stories. And before long, what happens? Well, we we end up thinking that there's nothing left for the story to teach us. There's nothing left for us to learn. The story becomes so well known that it almost becomes overlooked. We know it. And if we know it, there's no reason to reread it. If we know it, there's no reason to study it. That's a terrible trap for us to fall into because we know that that Scripture always has something to teach us. No matter how many times we have heard a story, no matter how many times we may have read it, no matter how much we think we might know about it, Scripture And the Holy Spirit working through Scripture always has something more that it can teach us. Always. There's so many ways that that you can look at this story of David and Goliath. So many things that, that we can pick out from it. But I think maybe one of the most important is that this story teaches us how to confront evil in our world. That's what Goliath represents, isn't it? Goliath represents evil. He represents that which is counter to the good life that God has planned for God's people. 
So how do you approach evil in the world? How do you handle it? How do you confront it? Or, or do you confront it at all? You see, normally there are two ways that I think we approach evil in the world. The first is to do like the Israelites and, and Saul does in the beginning of this story, and that's to ignore it or to hide from it. Their reaction to the challenge of evil, to Goliath's call each and every morning, is to simply stay put, to refuse to engage it. Every morning, the giant Goliath comes out and he says, Who will challenge me today? And every morning the Israelites do the same thing. They ignore it. They hide from it. That's a common response, isn't it? And why wouldn't it be? Evil is terrifying. That's the whole point of it. That's what makes evil so effective. Oppressors don't necessarily attempt to, to control with violence. No, they, they want to control with fear and intimidation, and that's what Goliath does. Those are far better forms of control than violence. Think about that. The Philistine army has accomplished all that they need to accomplish as long as Saul and his army remain frozen and afraid in their camp. When you can defeat your enemy without a, a single arrow, without a, a single blow, then there's no need to fight, is there? The Philistines are, are winning. The same can be applied to our own life. I wonder what Goliaths you face in the world. I wonder what Goliaths we, we face each and every day when we wake up. What are those things, those, those places of evil that attempt to intimidate us into inaction on God's behalf? There's a lot. There's a lot out there. You know, I, I can think about all these injustices that we see, that we, we face in the world. The, the economic and racial disparities, the, the systems that continue to strengthen those disparities and pull people apart. To speak out against those evils means what? It means to be labeled a, a radical. There's fear of ridicule, or worse yet, Fear that your, your own place, your own standing might be lost. And so what do we do? We keep our mouths shut. We don't lobby for change. We don't, we don't strive to enact policies that might upend the status quo because at the end of the day, we are intimidated and we are scared that maybe our status, our bottom line might be hurt. We're scared and intimidated into an action. And evil doesn't have to lift a finger. The second way we often react to confront evil in the world is just the opposite. It's to, to run straight at it. We put on the armor, we, we grab our swords, and we try to beat evil at its own game. But from experience, we know battling evil on its own terms, well, that's, that's never successful, is it? We will never win if we attempt to face the giants in our lives under the terms that they dictate to us. King Saul doesn't really understand this. When he recognizes the courage in David, what does he do? He puts his armor on David. He hands him his own sword. He prepares to send David into battle to face Goliath on the terms that Goliath wants to be faced. Right? Toe to toe. Sword to sword. But that'll never work. David understood that. He knows that the only way to beat Goliath is to do it in a way that is true to David's self. 
Not by mimicking the actions of Goliath. Not by pretending to be Saul. No, we, we can't go into battle wearing someone else's armor. It just won't work. We have to be true to ourselves, true to who we are, to who God made us to be. You know, the, the courage that David shows in this story is, is really beyond belief. Here's this, this kid, this shepherd, battling the, the best that the Philistine army has to offer. But it's not courage alone that defeats Goliath. No, there, there is something that David draws upon that no one else in this story, if you read it, draws upon. And this is really what's most important. If you don't take away anything else from today's message, I want you to take away this. And that's we cannot confront evil and win without the help of God. I want to say that again. We cannot confront evil and win without the help of God. One thing that, that we will come to see throughout this series is the faithfulness of David in his life. You can say what you want about him, but David, David strives to always be faithful to God. He doesn't always make the right decisions. He doesn't always choose the right paths. But he does strive to always be faithful to God. And David knows he cannot complete the task before him alone. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. David says, no matter how much courage or resourcefulness we may have, those things are never enough to win the battle against evil in the world. They're important. Don't hear me wrong. They are vital. Without them, David would never have made the move towards confronting Goliath. But our own courage, our own abilities are never enough when we confront evil in the world. Never. We always need the help of God. That's what we can learn from this story of David. Defeating evil requires a, a partnership between God and ourselves. We, we have to have the courage. We have to have the willingness to stand up against it. But we will never accomplish the defeat on our own. It's a partnership. It has to be between the power of God and the courage and the willingness of human participants. It's that partnership. That's what, what works to make the world a better place. So I want to ask you again this morning, what Goliaths do you see in our world? Where do you see evil? Where do you see injustice at work? What giants are we facing? What giants are you facing in your life? And how might God be calling you to stand up to them? Encourage? And with the help of the Holy Spirit. We will have to face evil. We always do. We have to face giants every day. But remember, it's not about confronting evil on evil's own terms. It's not even about trying to be someone or something that we are not. But it is about having enough faithfulness to realize that with a little bit of courage and a whole lot of power from the Holy Spirit. You can slay giants. Let us pray. O Lord of us all, 
This world is full of evil, and yet you are a God who confronts evil at every turn. Grant us the courage and the strength to stand up against the injustices that we see taking place. But grant us also the wisdom to understand that we cannot do this work, Lord, without your help. You've called us to be your partners in defeating evil. Lead us all to see that with faithfulness, with courage, and with the help of your Holy Spirit, we can come to slay whatever giants we might face in your name. For we pray this all in that name. Amen. Thank you again for filling in this morning. Let's give uh, Philip and Pilar a hand for, uh, for filling in this morning for renting the band. Thank you so much. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements before we wrap up this morning. Uh, first, if you would like to sign up for 9 a.m. nursery or either of the, the kids zones at 9 or 11, uh, if you would speak to Madeline directly, we're going to try something new. We're going to try to put people on a rotation. Uh, so so uh, speak to Madeline. She'll make sure to get you on the calendar. Uh, got a couple of other things coming up this week. On Tuesday, we have Young and Heart here in the Family Life Center. We also have a Red Cross blood drive. So if you've, you've not signed up uh, to give blood, I encourage you to head over to the Red Cross website and sign up there for, uh, for you to give blood. Um, with that said, uh, receive now this blessing and benediction. May you go forth in peace with the love of God, the grace of His Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May they be with you now and forevermore. Amen.